Okay, I believe I should be able to start at this stage. Good afternoon or morning or wherever you happen to be in, in the, whichever time zone you happen to be in. I'll just adjust my camera slightly there. Um, welcome to my training session on post-processing, basically. Um, I feel the title's a little bit poor. I usually use, I use these sessions as an excuse to delve a little bit more into particular areas of the code which interest me. And very often it's the, I, the title is the last thing I come up with. Unfortunately, from my perspective, Phil Cardiff is very much more if organized organized and efficient than I am and he was badgering us for titles for the different presentations months in advance so I put down something which is vaguely correct but it's a little bit dull maybe anyway I've titled it the command line interface that's the CLI bit in case you were wondering and runtime post-processing and open phone I wanted to look at function objects, which are one of the core aspects of post-processing and which blur the distinction between post-processing and runtime processing, really. And um, I wanted to show you some of the functionality there is in the code at the moment to do this. What level is this? Well, Phil very recently pointed out that the idea of saying, right, this is an advanced course, this is an introductory course, is a little bit difficult to manage. So he hasn't put in levels of course here. Um, I would say sort of, well, certainly the beginning is going to be somewhat introductory. And if you're just starting with open foam, this is probably stuff you don't know about and may hopefully you'll gain from it. Uh, but maybe if you're a bit more advanced, you've already met some of the earlier stuff. But I'm hoping to to ramp up the level and towards the end talk about um, some more complicated material and if, in the end I always like to put some programming in so I'll be talking about how to program your own function objects which should be interesting. Right if I'm right about this I can share my screen which I will do so now. So you're not now seeing my desktop on my two screens that I have here. The camera's above that one there but the screens that I'm talking about is over here and I'm doing it like that because I want to show you some slides I've got some slides prepared but also I've got some demonstrations I want to run um, normally I've come up with uh, uh, when I'm doing particular topics I've come up with particular cases I've developed them for the purpose with this one it's more about showing some of the tools so you can probably run a lot of these on um, cases copied over from the tutorial uh, um, installation, so the motorbike case or the Pitts Daily case or something like that. Having said that, I am actually going to use a case which I developed last year for one of my presentations, and it's a backward facing step, and I'll show you the details in a minute. But as I say, it's something which you can probably make use of on any case that you happen to have. I haven't yet put up any of this material. Um, I didn't have time to work out how exactly to do that, but I will share both the slides and any of the other material with the conference organisers afterwards, and I'm sure there'll be a mechanism for distributing them. Okay, I'm going to get a full screen for the moment, so slideshow. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> have my usual undergraduate level spiel. What do we mean by post-processing? Well, it's obviously an important part of CFD. We don't actually do CFD just to generate lots and lots of numbers. We actually want to be able to drill down and examine what they actually tell us about the physics and the engineering here. And typically there are, there are basically three areas we want to be able to deal with here. There's evaluation and, pro pro and processing the field. Fields. And that can be as simple as converting from kinematic pressure to total pressure, or it can be more complicated, like evaluating drag and lift coefficients. 
Then there's the aspect of sampling the data, so extracting information from the, from the simulation, and that's typically flow conditions at a point or multiple points in the flow, or across lines in the flow, which might match, um, these might match readings we've got experimentally for our validation. And finally, there's the obvious thing of the, the pretty picture side, the graphical pres presentation, isosurfaces, vectors, strings, lines and things like that. Open foam, of course, whenever you want to have a solution to something, open foam typically provides several different ways of doing it. And of course, one of the main area ways of post processing is power view. Power foam is the version distributed in the code. And you can do a lot of it that way. You can obviously give a graphical presentation, but also a certain amount of sampling can go on in power view. But the other main approach is that of function objects. And function objects are small pieces of code which can be added to your main code, to whichever solver app you're trying to run, in order to add to its functionality. And that functionality is typically being extended in order to provide an element of this post-processing. So these function objects can be invoked during the solver execution. You add them to the control dict file and then they are automatically um, evaluated during the uh, during the run you can control exactly how that's going to be done but there's also a mechanism the so-called command line interface or CLI whereby we can invoke these function objects um, by com typing commands on the terminal in the usual way so that's sort of that's post processing using this but the function objects are typically also being used as runtime processing. So there's a blurring of the distinction between these different activities. Now a word about um, which, which version I'm using here. And unfortunately, as I went through, I came to realize is there are si fairly significant syntactic um, differences growing up between the foundation version, and I'm using version 8 here, and for example the ESI version which would be 2012. Which, uh, yeah, 2012 was the most recent version. So as I say, I've been working on, I don't have an ax to grind on this particularly. I was using Open Foam 8 to develop these slides and I'm going to use that to run here, but I'm also going to mention, as far as I'm able to, as far as I could have identified, where things um, deviate between the two versions here. Now, <clears throat> I've mentioned that I've created a case to run on. Um, this was a while ago, last year, actually. It's a backward facing step. So you could use the Pitts Daily case, but I picked up some more recent um, data here. It's actually a numerical simulation, but based on, say, an actual experimental case here. And I used this particular paper, the data in here, to construct a very similar domain for my calculations here. And if you're interested, I've got the paper actually here and I'm happy to put that in with whatever material I distribute, basically. So it's a standard backward facing step here and step height, total length. And nicely, since it was a numerical calculation, they gave me a mesh resolution. So I ran with that. Now, I did this in order to construct both RANs and LES cases. And so I've got both of these to use here. My RANs case, I've made two dimensional. So it's in the XY plane here with, um, with the appropriate boundary conditions on the front and back, whilst the LES case, of course, is three dimensional and transient. So that's where that's coming from. Okay, so, <laughs> Uh, a little bit more about the po what I call post-processing, but again, it's um, processing of our, our results here, basically. And I've mentioned there is a command line interface, and the basic command here is something called post-process, and this provides a range of post-processing activities as 
function object modules, which you can access. You can do a lot in this. You can manipulate fields in various ways. You can evaluate dimension as groups. You can use it for sampling and so forth. Some of that can be run entirely separate of any other open phone code. But there are some post-processing activities which require access to quantities which are not necessarily saved on disk. And in particular here, when we're dealing with a turbulent case, you need access to more information about the turbulence model than is necessarily easily solved. And so when we're talking about post-processing, a lot of our post-processing involves using the post-process option on the solver. So I hesitate to say all of the solvers, but certainly all the ones I've tested, which is simple foam, piezo foam, and pimple foam, all of these have a post-process option, which doesn't solve anything, but essentially gives access to the post-process command, but provides it with additional information, which can then, which can be used to um, calculate particular properties as necessary. And I'll show you a bit more about how that works later on. Finally, as I say, the solvers themselves can be configured through the control dict in order to pr perform this function object post-processing during the execution. And depending on what you're aiming to do, what you're trying to do, one or other or, uh, of these different approaches may be what you actually need, what well, well, might be preferable. Simple things you probably are best off running using post-process. More complex complicated things, it may be easier to configure the function object in control dict and run it that way. So anyway, the basic command is this is uh, post process followed by various options. I'm actually going to jump out of here and let's actually go to the case here. This is BF step is my RANS calculation using the K omega model and particular inputs. So OF8, get the right version. Uh, I'll run simple form. Yep, okay. I always feel better when something like that works straight off, and it did. Usually at some point I run into a problem and you'll see me swearing into, into a microphone while I try and get it to work. Anyway, that seems to run. It's converged into 220 iterations, and we could look at the results um, quite reasonably. But let's do that. Um, go to the end. There we go, apply, and we've got all of the information we want here. And let's just display, let's just display it. So typical example here, um, I haven't been too sophisticated about the boundary conditions, but you can see in that velocity, resegregation, so everything we expect. And here are the different fields which have been calculated um, as a result of this. Um, and as part of the process of post-processing is adding to the different fields we want to get here. So what are we going to do with this? I'm going to open another um, terminal window, F8, and let's show you some of the commands here. So I'll put this up here and basic command here, post, pro, oops. The, probably the first one to learn about is this list option. And it does exactly what you might expect. It lists everything it knows about. So here is a complete list of everything you can use with uh, the command line interface with post-process straight off. So these ones do not involve using simple foam or anything like that. These are things you can run as post-process funk and, uh, and one of these uh, function objects here. And there are various different types of modules. A lot of them are about field manipulation. You can add and subtract fields. You can also calculate new quantities like the, well, like for example, entropy, vorticity and so forth. And we'll talk about some of those in a minute. You can also use this to calculate flow rates 
and forces. So integrating over surfaces and patches in the field, in the, in the, in the domain rather, and also sampling and probing the data to extract data like that. By the way, you've seen how terrible my typing here is. I do have a crib sheet. And I'm going to start copying things across to make sure it all works fine. OK, basic field manipulation, the, the nuts and bolts here. There are a lot of things you'll notice here, like add and later, later down here, subtract, I think somewhere. Yeah, subtract there, which are what I like to think of as mathematical operations here. If you've got add, you're adding, you're providing a list of fields to add up, subtract, you're providing a list of fields and from the first one in the list, it subtracts all of the others and so forth. So you can do basic um, field algebra on it. You can also work out important quantities, magnitude, mag square, but also things like logarithm, natural logarithm, and you can scale a field and you can add a random component and so forth. You can pro start probing the information as well. So one typical thing we might want to know is what is the maximum value in a field? What's the minimum value? So there are cell max and cell min, face max and face min commands. We can evaluate derivatives. So we can ask it, if you look here, there's some um, DDT div here. So fairly obvious, grad is lower down. These are explicit evaluations of these quantities. Now, one thing to realize is that we, even though it's an explicit evaluation based on known values, there are many different numerical ways in which we, we can actually do that. And we may have to explain to open foam what differencing scheme we want to use. And of course, that means we may have to put a new entry into FV schemes in order to kind of deal with that. Finally, well, not finally, but and finally on my list here, various flow parameters such as the entropy and syntropy or the vorticity can be evaluated here. Now, if I just run it like that, I will find that it generates it calculates values for all of the time steps. You can restrict that. You can specify a particular time step or a range of time steps using a time flag, or you can use a latest time flag for the latest time flag, or you can use, I think it's no zero in order to do everything except the zero time step, which could be quite useful. So that being so, let's actually run some of these. And just to demonstrate to begin with, you'll see here no sign of a vorticity, but I'm quite interested in the vorticity. So I would like to calculate the vorticity. Vorticity, of course, is the curl of the velocity. So it's going to be a vector. So I'm going to use this post process. Func object means we're going to run a function here. Post process can do other things as well, but we're concentrating on the functionality provided by the um, function objects here. Vorticity. There we go. And it is run. And we now have a vorticity field, which if I open it up is going to look much as we, we had expected there. I can do this as well for the entropy. I might try copying it across. Why not? There you go. That's a bit quicker. And the same thing. So you'll notice as it runs each time step directory that it's processing it tells you which one it is here. And it is a uh, telling you it's reading in the field and then executing the appropriate function object in order to do the calculation. I could restrict it a little bit further. So um, let's try. Flow type is a function object which <coughs> calculates a parameter going from minus one to plus one, representing the mathematical state of the flow in that, um, that particular cell, basically. So minus one is an entirely rotational flow. Zero is a simple shear. Plus one is planar extension. And any value in between indicates a degree of blending of those basic things there. So supposing I want to do this for, oops, for time 200 like that, 
Of course, it's actually an iteration number because this is a simple phone, but hell, what the hell. So this should, and I haven't tried this, but it should work. This should calculate the flow time only for the 200th time step. And it's just done that. So 220, no sign of a flow type field but if i go to 200 here there's a flow type here and you can see values going from well there are some negative ones there going from minus something or other to plus something or other there and of course since we've now got all of these in here they should now be uh, accessible inside the uh, inside paraview i actually don't quite know if i need to go out and redo this i may ah oh, there you go that's giving me access to everything i wanted to 200 so now i can post process the information here and for example here is my flow type variable and going from minus 0.19 to plus 0.87 across there or i can do other things i mentioned the the entry i've mentioned the vorticity magnitude of the vorticity here which is related to the entropy i'm getting the values as i can see there question here i just spotted yeah we're gonna have the average of field over several time steps with post-processing thank you for asking me that i'm coming to that later on so um well I'll rephrase that. It is possible. There is a command line interface command which enables you to um, time average saved time steps. So one of the command line, the post process um, options here is an average of time steps. But of course, that would be only those time steps which we have bothered to save here. Later, so I, I didn't actually cover that. I found I didn't have enough time. But what I am going to cover later on is function objects for time averaging more general, hence the LES case. So we'll, uh, we'll get onto that in a minute. Okay, some of the other things here, some further, um, some further things here. I mentioned processing the fields and I was things like adding them up and subtracting and I thought well I'm not quite sure what I'm going to use to demonstrate this because I don't really want to add pressure to turbulent kinetic energy or something like that or pressure to pressure what am I going to do I and mean, it suddenly occurred to me there's a command line interface command here components which will give me exactly what I want uh, give me a useful thing here with this it takes the velocity field and turns it into the ux uy and uz component so I've got my got it on my crib sheet. So I'll copy that across. And you'll notice that you this is a, a function object which will take actually any vector field and split it up into its components. We might want to do this on the vorticity, it doesn't have to be the velocity. Of course, that means we have to pass it an argument explaining which which vector field we want to process, in this case U, which means we need brackets, which unfortunately means when it comes to a command line, we, need, we can't just type it like that. We need to use inverted commas in order to demonstrate to the, um, the shell interface what we mean, basically. So we're passing U to this um, function object components, and I've used inverted commas to, um, to complete the command here. So if I do that, there we go. And you can see U here is a field of vectors, and it has now generated a series of Svold scalar fields, which are my UX, UY, and UZ components here. And in fact, I could do exactly this, but the, for the vorticity, like that. And you can see that broke up my vorticity field into UX, UI, and UZ components there.
I guess, of course, there's no component of the vorticity in the x direction because it's a two dimensional case that would account for that. OK, having done that, I've now got ux, uy and uz, and maybe I want to work out the sum of those. Actually, that could be something I'd want to do for some reason. So I've got another command to show you here, another function object add, which adds up the list of of fields you provide it. So this is going to add UX, UI, and UZ. Or to be a little bit more uh, pedantic, it's going to take UX and add it and add UI and UZ to it. I could also have subtract, which would take UX and subtract UI and UZ. Right, like that. Now, of course, we've got the question, how is this going to show up? And you've just seen how this shows up. You'll see the um, command here was add UX, UI, and UZ, and it's created me a field labeled using that mathematical nomenclature. So the field, the evolved scalar field here is called add UX, UI, UZ, and it should indeed be, well, I'm not going to show it to you. You can you can play around with this at home when you get an opportunity. But you can you could show that that is actually the sum of that one and that one and that one if you wanted to. Okay, I've mentioned gradient, working out the gradient of the pressure, the gradient of, a, of any variable. So again, I can use this to work out the gradient of any von scalar field here. The pressure is the obvious one. So running that particular command and I get a field here, which is the gradient of the pressure and it's a vector as you might expect. Next one, I've mentioned the divergence here. So let's have a go with it like that. Ah, now I did that deliberately. I really did do this one deliberately. You'll see it's gone wrong. Now, Depending on how, how much experience you've had with OpenFlow, we may or may not regard the error messages as being um, worrying. They can be a bit um, terse and a bit complicated, but if you dig down, you can usually work out what they're saying to you. And in this case, um, what it said, ignore this bit, which is a warning, which throws that, which I find gets thrown up on a number of these without actually meaning anything. But the fatal error here, keyword div u is undefined in the divergence schemes. And that's what I was mentioning earlier. If we go to system, um, FE schemes here, I'll open it like that. This of course is where we log all of the differencing schemes we are going to use for our different evaluations here. And in this case, it's complaining that um, we're missing something div u in div schemes here. You'll see I have a default none here. So what I need to do here is to give it an actual definition of um, div u, which I can then use. And for It's not going to make any difference what I use here. So Gauss linear will hopefully do the job. So if I run that again, there we go. It's run. As I say, ignore the warning. It has actually gone. Give you. There we go. There's the divergence of my U field there. So those are my two additional ones there, derivatives, gradient of U, divergence of U, and we may end up having to put additional entries into the FE schemes directory, uh, sorry, dictionary to cope with it. Okay, so that's a very basic use. Now I mentioned combining fields and so forth to calculate new quantities, and one obvious thing is that open foam calculates the pressure. And since this is a, a, an incompressible case, it's actually kind of calculating what is sometimes called the kinematic pressure. So pressure divided by density, but that's not the only pressure we might be interested in. There are various other ones we might want to look at. So post-process can be used to convert our calculated pressure into various different alternatives. And for example, we can easily convert it to the static pressure by multiplying by the fluid density. 
but there's also the total pressure, which is the reference pressure, whatever that happens to be, plus the kinematic pressure we've got here, plus a half rho u squared. And there are commands here, the function here, the uh, the function object here is static pressure, whilst for the total pressure, the function object is called total pressure incompressible. Now, so I'll actually expand this a little bit more um, like that, so it's a little bit more obvious what I'm doing here. In both of these cases, we need to pass in further information. I mean, to scale by the fluid density, we need to give it a fluid density. And if that isn't already part of the calculation, this is something I want to specify. Similarly, if so, so the, the, this command needs to apply to the calculated pressure P here, but it needs to multiply it by the density. I need to specify what the density is here. So I've now got a number of arguments here. The first one, of course, is just the pressure, but the other ones I am passing in things which are maybe which would need to be um, provided to do the calculation. So in this case, we're saying that the density here is going to be given by a single parameter rho inf. You could also multiply it by a density field if you happen to have one, and you'd be able to provide that there, but I'm not, this is an incompressible flow, I decided it's water, so I'm going to give it a row in for the thousand kilograms per cubic meter, usual, usual value there. One thing, this is if you know Python, actually if, I just realized a couple of days ago, this is very much like Python in a way. If you know Python, you'll know that very, you can produce a function with a lot of arguments and you can provide um, defaults for those arguments, which your user can but doesn't have to override. So in this case, there are a whole bunch of parameters I could supply here. I've given them three. I need to give, them, give it at least the pressure. I didn't need to give it the others, but I can override the defaults which come with the function here. And similarly for post-process total pressure incompressible, we're passing it the pressure and the velocity fields, but we can also pro provide the additional information here which we need to do the calculations. So I'm in a position hopefully to do that. Where's my crib sheet? So just to show you the static pressure, how that comes out. There we go. And we've now got in here a static pressure here, which has been evaluated. And you'll see the dimensions have changed from the dimensions of pressure because we've multiplied by the density. And similarly, same thing, total pressure incompressible like that. And that's given me a total pressure here. Only didn't include this because I didn't think there's going to be time, but there's also a version of this for it for compressible flow, which works in much the same sort of way. Okay, that's dealt with what I want to do in terms of this, the basic post-process command for the command line interface. But I mentioned that um, for so we're calculating some of these values, we need access to the turbulence model, and so we have to run simple foam in some mechanism. The mechanism this we use for this is simple foam has a flag here, post process, which bumps it into post processing mode and allows you to access those function objects which need access to the turbulence model. And I put down three of these, which are things we very often want to calculate as part of our turbulence calculations here. So things like turbulence intensity, like the wall shear stress and the Y plus values at the boundaries. That would seem to be a nice one to go for. So I can use this to calculate a Y plus field. And you'll see here that it's written 
it out for each time step here. It has actually generated somewhere around here, y plus here, which is a field of values. Probably it's the boundary values, which are the important ones, because that's where y plus is really being evaluated. But at the same time, it's written out maximum and minimum values across the, across the boundaries of the mesh. So I can see here for each each patch, the minimum, the maximum, and the average y plus values. These other two um, commands are also quite useful there. And then one thing, which is another thing which is quite useful, um, when you're running a Reynolds stress model, Reynolds stress models are quite difficult to get to run in the first place. And so it's very useful to run an initial k epsilon calculation and then restart from that and refine it with your Reynolds stress model. That saves a whole load of heartache in terms of starting the calculation up, because if you're starting from a blank field, a uniform field, chances are your Reynolds stress model will blow up before it converges. So starting from a, an approximate solution is the way to go. But of course, that means we need to calculate the Reynolds stress field as a starting solution. And we can do that by basing it again on the k epsilon values here and assume the isotropy. It will become anisotropic as we calculate, but we need a command to evaluate these Reynolds stresses. And there's one to do this in post-process, the function r like this, which will generate a vol tensor field which it, which we could then use to start as a as a as a Reynolds stress calculation. There we go. So that's done that. And in here we have it's a symmetric tensor, obviously. So we've actually got um, five components here. Um, of which at least one of them is zero because of the uh, because it's in two dimensions in space. But there you go. I could then use this to restart and calculate using a Reynolds stress model. I probably ought to stop at pause at this point. Ah, right. I've got a whole bunch of um, blum blum blum. I better. Um, Okay, Vishal, um, I will, I only finished writing these slides yesterday about 11.30 at night, so I didn't get around to uploading them. After this is all over, I'll talk to Phil Cardiff and find out a way of distributing the slides, my crib sheet, and also these cases for you to play around with. That, that, that's the idea, yes, that's a good idea. Um, Chandan, uh, why the Vorticity X did not work? Work. Um, well, um, that's a good question. I hadn't thought about that actually. It seems to me instinctively correct in that the vorticity is a vector and the x component depends on du y by dz minus du z by dy and things like that. So I would expect I would have to sit down and work out the exact maths here, but it, I, off the top of my head, at least one of these components is going to be zero. But I'm not quite sure why two of them aren't zero, which they are. Hey, yeah, that's it. Yes, vorticity x is zero, vorticity y is zero, vorticity z, which is the one which combines ux, uy, and the derivatives there, is non zero, which is correct. So, yeah, we're okay there. Um, static pressure you've specified, rho is rho inf. You mentioned there are default values. Is there an easy way to spit out the defaults? Um, or must you dig into the source? I will show you a little bit more about that later on. I will come back to that. Post-processing function for calculating free surface elevation. I think there is. Um, but again, you might have to do a little bit of digging to find it. I think I did see something. Surfaces might be it. I can't off the top of my head say, I'm afraid, but I think there may be, yes. Okay, so at this point, 
basically because I had, you'll, you'll notice I've gone on to a section here on turbulence and um, this enables me to introduce you to one of the other things I've got here, which is BF step LES. I chose this particular example exactly because it was three dimensional. I wanted to do some LES. So I've got a calculation here, which I've started from the capsilon run here at zero, ran for 15 seconds to get it to develop, and then have run a little bit further using piezo foam in order to generate some results to show you. And I should be able to show you some of this. Oh, sorry. This takes a little bit longer to start up, as you can see, but I can at least show you the state of the geometry here and the mesh like that. And I can show you some of the values here. So let's go to time 15. And there's probably the velocity here already. And you can see this got a very different view to it from the Rand's case, because of course, this is now an instantaneous velocity here. So we are going, we are seeing the instantaneous state of a lot of the turbulence, which is still developing at this point, by the way. I could probably run it a little bit more in order to get there. Now, there are a number of things we might want to do with um, turbulence, like with, with LES runs. And in particular, we are very interested in visualizing the turbulence. And there are a number of things which we might want to do here. Now, one obvious thing is the entropy, which and the vorticity of that matter. The vorticity is the curl of the velocity, and now it will have the three components. But entropy is a scalar quantity amalgamating all three of those components. So it's um, based on the magnitude squared like this. And I've gone through this particular command. I can run it on this to get an entropy calculation, which I can then post process. I can then visualize in ParaView. But there are other things which enable, now that is, they give us a picture which we can eyeball and understand where the vortices are and so forth. But there are other parameters we might want to evaluate which enable us to identify these, um, these vortices much more accurately. One of these is something called the Q, well the two of them, Q criteria and lambda two. And these are both based on properties of the gradient of the velocity. Now, velocity is a vector, its gradient is therefore a second rank tensor, and as a three by three matrix has three invariants which describe its properties. And they're often defined as one, two, and three, or P, Q, and R like this. Q is a half trace squared minus the trace of the square of J, where J is that, and you can show mathematically that if Q is less than zero, you're in a region of large strain, whilst if Q is greater than zero, you're in a region of large entropy and therefore rotation. So that will help you identify the, um, the vortices in the flow. Alternatively, if you can work out the eigenvalues and arrange them, then the structure is going to be a vortex if at least two of the eigenvalues are negative. Now, no matter how you arrange them, that means it boils down to if the second eigenvalue is less than zero, providing you rate, sorry, if you've got them arranged one, two, three like this, that boils down to look at the second eigenvalue. If that's negative, then it's a vector. Sorry, then it's vortex rather. And both of these are available through this post process command. So func q evaluates the q criteria through an appropriate function object, whilst func lambda 2 does the same thing for the second invariant like that. So I think I'm right in saying I've already done those. Um, that, yep, there we go. There's my Q criteria here. So let's pull that in and I can 
evaluate it there. I would have to, for best results here, I'd have to fiddle with the color map, but I'm sure you can see there are different values of Q here corresponding to the core of the vortex as it goes through. You can see I've also got the entropy here, which of course I can also plot and you can see where that's high. And again, if I spend a little bit of time playing around with the color map, I could really pull out the information here. I've even got Lambda 2. I'd forgotten I'd run all of these. So it should go from um, negative to positive. And again, with a bit of post-processing. A lot of this, by the way, of course, is being badly adjusted because I got a uniform inlet. So a lot of shear is happening right at the inlet here, and it's rather masking the flow patterns here, which is a pity. But I'm not disposed to waste a lot of time processing that. I've shown you the results. So I, I show you, I show, I'm concentrating on, on the commands here. Okay, next section of my, my um, presentation here is on sampling. Ah, Benjamin, how do you post-process a resolved versus model turbulent kinetic energy for cases such as LES? Ah, again, have patience, I'm coming to, I'm, I'm, that, that's my last example, well, something related to that is my last example, so if I don't, don't mention it, so if I don't get to it, please remind me. Do you know why turbulent post-process values such as Y plus um, or turbulence properties K are not calculated? Are specific turbulence models not fit for these functions? Um, I don't know. I think I'd have to look at exactly what you're doing. Y plus, of course, is a general parameter, but you're probably needing to use variables out of the K epsilon model in order to evaluate it. So I suspect that what it is, is if you've run a calculation that doesn't use Capsilon or something similar, the data may not be there to actually calculate your Y plus values. That's just a guess. I'd have to look at your particular case. Um, but it's often worth running Capsilon, even if you don't think it's a very good model for the case, simply in order to get an idea on the flow there. Okay, so moving quickly on. I've mentioned sampling as another sort of activity. So moving on from manipulating the fields, how about sampling them to identify what we've got in particular locations? And there are two types of things we might want to do. We've got, maybe we've got a, some sort of, uh, I know, pitot tube ca calculating, the, uh, measuring the pressure at a particular location. We want to compare that with the value from our calculation. Or we've used LDA to count or, or something like that to calculate the velocities along a line across our ducts like that, and we want to compare the flow profiles. So we want to be able to probe the flow in these different ways. And there are post-processing post commands for doing exactly that. Now I've set up this um, picture to show you where I want to sample. And I've decided that I'm going to sample my flow. The origin here is at the bottom of the step here. My um, Domain is 1.75 meters long here, and it's 0.1 meter up here, and it's 0.01 meters thickness because it's one cell thick for the Rand's case here. So I decided quite arbitrarily in this case that I would want to sample along a line at x equals 0.5 meters and a point at x equals one meter. So how are we going to do this? Well, once again, there are um, command line um, things you can do in order to do exactly this. Now, I'm sure you can imagine that we might have to put a lot of information in in order to um, specify where some of this actually is. So typing it all in at the command line is really not practical. Instead, we're going to use a, um, a, a dictionary file appropriate for the command, for the function object, to put in the information. 
We want to sample at a particular location. We're going to use a function object called probes and one command. And so we're going to need a um, dictionary file called probes. I'm not quite sure why it's not called probes dict, but it's called probes here, which um, which is going to specify the location of that probe or potentially multiple probes. Now, um, because there isn't any kind of um, interface here, we always end up having to copy files across and modify. And sorry about this. I hope my wife's going to pick that up. It may go to the answering machine. Sorry about that. Um, where was I? Yeah. Um, the question is, how do we start? What do we use to set all of this up? And there's a very useful command in the library called phone get, which looks in the installation and copies across the appropriate files. So it knows about a lot of the setup you might want to do, and it copies the appropriate files to the appropriate places in your, in your case directory. In this case, I want to copy across something called, something related to probes here. So, um, get you can see it's given me several different options here. I actually need option one here. I want to copy across the dictionary files and it's done that. So if I now go back to backward facing step here, I've done this in the right place. There we go. I've copied across pro a file called probes here. And that is the basic structure of my um, dictionary file for specifying where to probe the data here. It's very basic here. It's given me the basic spaces, basic things that I might want to change, specifying the fields. It can you can specify one field as field P or fields brackets P or a list of fields like this. And you can also supply a list of probe locations. Now, that, none of that's actually uh, what I want here, but the probe location isn't in fact correct. So I'm going to replace that from my crib sheet here. And as I say, I've specified one meter downstream from the step and halfway across the domain. So it's 10 centimeters from side to side at that point. So I've got five centimeters. And as I say, since everything is three dimensional, I've actually got a layer of cells here, which is point is one centimeter thick. So I've specified in the middle of those cells because otherwise my sampling point is going to be outside what open phone regards as any kind of cell. So I've done that, so I've modified it like that, and I can now um, run, I've just realized I haven't actually given the command here, but this should work. So post process func probes like that. There we go. And it's run, the, it's run the post processing activity. And now this has given me a new directory in my case directory called post processing. Um, actually, I got one from Y plus as well, didn't I? So going to probes here, zero, and it's given me files here, P and U. If I examine them, pressure, there we go. This is a list of the times, i the iteration steps here, and the values of my pressure at that probe location at that time step directory. So I could bung this into a plotting package and get a graph of how the pressure has changed over the course of my simulation. And of course, if I've got a, a transient run, I've actually got time steps saved, and that would be my pressure evolution over time. And similarly for the velocity here, same sort of thing. So again, the iteration number here, labels as times and the velocity vectors at those particular cases, which are the ones which have been saved. Graphing things um, is another activity we might want to do here. Um, 
we want to identify, we want to be able to extract information across a line in the domain, which can again be plotted up as a graph. Now, this is one of these areas where the different versions have got slightly different commands. In version eight from the foundation, um, and by the way, I'm not, I am not um, plugging the foundation, I just tend to use it. So for, for reasons, for historical reasons as much as anything else. Anyway, they've got a command single graph, which can be used to generate graphs for, or data for graphs from your calculations. Other versions, the ESI version uses a slightly older command here. Once again, there are going to be dictionary files to set this up and we can access these using this set, um, phone get command. And it's copied that over to the system. And once again, we can go into system here and single graph here is a dictionary file which enables you to specify the start and the end of the line you want to sample, the fields you want to sample and aspects of the configuration you want to set up. So what sort of sampling to use and what to do about the axis. And it looks really simple because it also includes some configuration files, which I had a look at and decided that actually I don't like this. I don't like this because it's actually not significantly more complicated not to have those configuration files and just to do the whole thing. All the configuration file does is to pull in some information and set it up, which is then overridden here. So I thought, what's the point? So what I've done here, if I can find my crypt sheet here, single graph, copy that across and um, replace like that. I basically, I'll open that in, in Emacs actually, there we go. I actually constructed my own um, single graph um, input file here to explain what the different options actually are. So we've got a start and an end point here and I've specified those to be the start and the end points of my sampling line across here. I'm just going to do this for the pressure, I could do for the velocity as well. There are a couple of things here in terms of how we want to interpolate from the cell values to the point values because of course the data is being saved at the cell centers but our cutting line doesn't necessarily go through those so there's a certain amount of interpolation involved here and there are various different configurations we can set up for what type of sampling we're going to do. Line cell is just an ordinary line going through the, um, through, through the domain and picking up values from the closest cell to the particular point. So you'll basically get one value for each cell it traverses. Line in uniform, um, is an even simpler, in, 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 you're specifying exactly how many points you want and they will be evenly distributed and that may well mean that you miss some cells or sample some cells more than once, whilst line cell face is like line cell but pulls in face center information to do the interpolation. And there's various more information there. Um, different axes here. You can specify for the X axis of your graph distance, which is the distance along the line you've specified, or you can specify the X, Y or Z components of the position of your sampling points, or X, Y, Z gives you all three of those at the same time. So I've, since I am working across the domain like this, I am specifying here that I want my x-axis for my graph to be the y values along this line and up the axis of my graph are going to be the values here. And when I run this, as I will do in a minute, hopefully, yeah, that's all the information there. Um, if I run single graph here, so there we 
There we go. That has evaluated this for the pressure field for each of my saved time step directories here. And if we go into post processing, we've now got a single graph here. And in each of these, there's a file which is the y coordinate. So that's my dependent variable on my axis across here and the pressure value, which is going to be up this axis here. And I could plot this, for example, on XM Grace, uh, which is my favorite pack plotting package. Oops, didn't need to put that in twice, but there we go, there's my um, sampled pressure across the line. I could probably flip that over to get it the right way around there. Oops. Okay, since I am um, Sorry, a bit of lost. Oh, just sorry, I'm. Ah, oh, there you go. There's the session. That's what I was looking for there. Okay, any um, one more question here from Benjamin Tan. For very large transient cases, we often have to perform runtime sampling while the fields are purged to maintain case files at a manageable level. Yes. Is this the best practice? Do you have any tips to manage this better? Great question, because that really brings us on to the next stage, which is function objects used during runtime. And this is what function objects can, one thing's function objects can be used to do very definitively. I have a PhD student, and then you may have been in her uh, um, presentation earlier on today, um, Anna Feichner, who had exactly that problem. She was um, trying to do averaging of a very large number of time steps in her calculation. She was trying to do it by saving every single time step directory that was running out of um, disk space. That's not the best way of doing it. One of the big uses of function object is getting around this by adding functionality, which is run at runtime, and which can allow you to just save those pieces of information that you don't want, that you, that you actually need to, without necessarily saving all of the fields that you've got in your calculation. So for example, I could set this up to output my sampled velocities at every single time step. And that's going to be a, a simple list of values, which is going to be only a few kilobytes in size, perhaps a few um, megabytes is a really long calculation, rather than saving the time step directories and all of the data in them. And um, it goes even further. I'm going to show you how to produce graphical output, which is quite useful if you want to do, say, an animation and you can literally save a VTK file for each image for each time step without having to save all of the data which goes into generating that. So, great question because it now brings me on to my next topic which is function objects used as runtime processing basically. This post-process command is basically invoking specific function objects and we can but we can also use them by putting them into putting information into control dict which then activates those function objects and runs them during the execution of the calculation. So any function object you put into control dict will be automatically executed during the simulation run. Although we can still use a post process option on the solver in order to simply in, uh, evaluate the function objects in control dict without running the code itself. 
And my impression is that some of these function objects can be easily run through the command line interface, but others, which are more complicated, are best done through the control dict. Now, there are template directories, sorry, dictionaries rather, for a lot of these function objects in this, um, in the, in the, um, in the library, in this particular directory here, etc. case dicts post processing. I can even take you there. Let's have a um, terminal here. So eight I may or may not work. The, oh no, it's not gonna work. Okay. So let's do it this way. Phone, go to phone here, etc. Um case dicts. Um, post processing. You can see min, max, pressure, solvers, control, all of these. You go into them um, for fields, for example. Oops. You can see a lot of these things which we've come across already. These are things like log, add, instrophy, and so forth. These are the function objects, and these are. Um, input dictionaries which we could use in the con control dict in order to activate these particular function objects and we can copy them across so if you use phone get it will pull out the right the right configuration files and copy them across so phone get total entropy for example would copy across this file and put it in the right place basically and that's quite useful Further information, you asked me earlier about um, where we can find some of this out. You can, of course, find it out from the user guide, but I have to say I find that's a bit limited. It lists the different function objects, doesn't really give very much information about a lot of them. When I was pro when, when I was um, preparing this, I did what I often do, which is to go online to the um, to the user guide, and in particular, both Foundation and the SI version have the online um, user guide information stripped straight out of the library files. And you'll see here, this is for the version 2012, the ESI version, an entry here, function objects, forces, for example, forces, I click on here, there is information which you can pull straight out of the code itself, which is about the use of the fun forces function object, including mathematical expressions, which is what it's evaluating, information about its usage, a simple version here, that's a minimum working version, or the full set of input entries here. And you could easily copy this across into your control dict and alter the different values here in order to set up your calculation. And to a certain extent, that's what I've done here. It's even giving you sample output and so forth. And for that matter, the Open Foam Foundation version does exactly the same thing. And um, it's in namespace list foam. Um, there shot the function objects. There we go. There we go. Somewhat the different presentation here, but exactly the same sort of thing. Ah, somebody asked about interface height. There we go, interface height. There is the class reference for interface height and a certain amount of information there about how to make use of it, basically. So as an example here, which I don't think I'll demonstrate, but I'll show it to you. Um, <clears throat> here is the appropriate input file for the vorticity. And you'll notice I called it vorticity GRT. The first entry here is the name that I'm going to use to associate with the instance of the, this particular function object here. So I can name it whatever I like. Inside the subdictionary are a number of, of, um, uh, of dictionary entries which will control it. We need to specify what function object it is and link it to the appropriate shared object, ob shared object library there. But then there are various different optional entries which may or may not need to be set. 
And in particular here, execute control specifies when the function object is going to be executed. In this case, time based on the time step, every time step, or I could do every 10 time steps, and how frequently to write out. So write control, write time means that it's going to write out every time the calculation writes out um, the, the, the other variables, basically. But I could change that so only the, so I would end up writing out the vorticity at different times from everything else and maybe more frequently. So again, somebody asked me how to do this. This is something you can control here. To run it as a post-processing exercise, you can run simple phone post-process and it will execute this code. Or alternatively, if we run it at runtime, it will run during the actual execution. So let's have a go at some of this. Um, let's go back to here and um, system so control dict here and standard control dict and the last entry here is one called functions and functions groups together all of the function objects we want to execute if you look at the examples in the library you'll see that very often they are included in separate files brought in using this include func and that can be that can make it a lot easier to, to switch things on and off like this but i'm just going to deal with this by just copying things into here and so in this particular case um um, um so i have crib sheet Where's it gone to? So here is my vorticity GRT. There we go. That is going to activate the vorticity function object. It's going to use these particular values here to play around with it. And the result is going to be labeled vorticity GRT. So let us. Um, having done that, I'm getting a bit, I'll get rid of that one. Um, here we go. So running it just as a simple phone with a post-process flag will just execute the function objects here. Which I'll do there. There we go. That's now done it for each time step directory. And you'll notice if we now go into the time step directories, I've now got a file called vorticity GRT. Vorticity here was what I calculated earlier. Vorticity GRT is using the same function object, but I've given it a different name. And we should find that actually exactly the same values as here, which it is indeed, there we go. So it's done exactly the same thing. Now it was a slightly banal case because let's face it, vorticity, there's not very much there I needed to specify, except if I wanted to have vorticity evaluated at different times in my calculation. So if I ran this as, uh, well, let's just demonstrate that actually. That I will. Just to demonstrate this, I'm going to get rid of all of these directories here. And okay, that's done the calculation. If I go into here, you'll see, well, I haven't got my vorticity field any longer, but I do have vorticity GRT. It's evaluated that function object at each, at e during the execution and printed it out for every time step that I wanted to save. More complicated example here, the pressure here. Now I've shown you you can run this as a command line um, activity, but there are a number of parameters we wanted to set here. So possibly easier to do this using a um, using a, a function object. So I'll get rid of this particular one. and substitute this one, here we go. 
Now, again, I've given it the name pressure GRT to identify it, but it's the pressure here. It's connected to the appropriate function object library. It's going to calculate the total pressure here. And I've specified various different options here. So my row field is going to be this constant value of 1000 here. So if I now run this again, simple phone, there we go. Let's rerun the calculation. And now in addition to the pressure, which has dimension set 0, 2, minus 2, it's now also given me total P here, which has dimension set 1, minus 1, minus 2, and that's my total pressure there. I might add this is one area where the different versions have significantly different um, syntaxes. I've written out on this slide formulae for static and total pressure and the pressure coefficient. And we can evaluate all of these as well as the isentropic pressure of its compressible case. And there is more information to be found at these different locations. So if I, for example, copy this across, copy link address, um, here we go. So here's the version 2012 user guide here. And you can see it's very complete. It's got a, an example of the pressure function here. And what the different entries mean? Are they defaults? Are they required? What the values are here? And other information which you might find really quite useful. And you can adapt this to output pressures and pressure coefficients as you need to. I'm speeding up slightly because I'm aware that I've got about another 15 minutes here and still quite a number of rather complicated slides to cover here. I'd like to see if I can take some more questions. One of the big uses of function objects is evaluating forces and force coefficients. And in fact, if you look through the library, through the various tutorial files in the library, quite a number of the examples do exactly that. I'm not going to demonstrate this because it's fairly well covered. And maybe you'd like to consider this as your homework. Now that I've shown you how to find these things in the source code, you might like to have go and have a look at it, basically. So, for example, Another one here, let's pull this out again. Forces and force coefficients. The basic class here, by the way, is forces. So forces is a function object which evaluates the pressure force and the viscous force on any surface you might want to evaluate it for. And the full set of input entries are given here. You can specify a specific center of rotation for the moment as well, for example. And for example, um, for in this case, it assumes that the case is compressible, but you can switch it to incompressible and provide a density entry to fix it, set the free screen density there. Derived from forces is another set of class, another function object called force coefficients, which goes further. And this calculates the different, um, different force coefficients. And I think it must be in the um, foundation version. There's more information about how to do that. So how, how it is doing that. So. Oh, I thought it was. Sorry. My apologies. But anyway, it extends this to compute force and moment coefficients and the input dictionary enables you to fit, set things like the air cross-sectional area and so forth. OK, moving on. Now, another thing which was questioned earlier was averaging. And the answer to this short answer to your question, by the way, is can we work out, can we average time steps? Yes, we can. And there's a command line command for doing that. But this is based on a field average function object, which if you implemented it as a field, as a function object, is much more flexible. 
because of course we don't want we don't want to have to save every time step we're going to average over for something like an ads run we want to average over the time steps and then only save the results every so often and running this field average function object enables us to do exactly that. So field average controls the averaging process for the different variables and in particular will give you a, an arithmetical mean over the different time steps it averages over and also the variance, so the fluctuations squared and average i think i've got that the wrong way around but that's the that's the variance basically so this is your basic um, function object entry in control dict and type field average that's the function object the link to the shared object library there write control i'm going to write this out at the same time as i'm writing out the other values here and i'm going to i want to do this with particular fields and in this particular case i'm saying i want to average the velocity field i want to have both the um average and the variance and the base gives a little bit more information as to what it's going to do when it's restarted basically so base controls what i is here so what, what i is here time step or iteration you can also include an optional averaging unit so you can say i want to average over a window of 20 time steps or something like that the restart behavior gets controlled by additional switches restart on restart restart on output or periodic restart restart on restart means when you stop the calculation and then restart it it will scrub everything and start averaging but then afterwards it just accumulates the average restart on output means every time it writes out the field it restarts the averaging process periodic restart means i want to restart the averaging process every 10 seconds or whatever it is what do we get out of this? Well, the average field names are constructed from the base field, so U in this case, and the averaging type. So we'll get a U mean and a U prime two mean. And actually, if we go back to my LES calculation, because I've been running it here, you'll see I've got U mean and U prime two mean, and I can visualize those relatively straightforwardly. Okay, since I've got to that point, this might be a good point to see whether or not I've got any further, any further questions. Um, see where I've got to. Okay, a couple of questions from Lionel. Um, have you been able to create images at runtime? Um, I think I'll show you, I'm coming on to that next thing, I think, actually. Um, does the runtime post processing function object require specific compilation of the VTK library? I don't know, I'm sorry, I'll have to look at that. Um, what kind of interpolation does the probes function use? What's the difference between using probes and cloud points for the sample dict? Um, interpolation, I would have to look through the user, the user guide, uh, sorry, the, the um, information there. I would imagine that it is a simple, um, a simple linear or quadratic interpolation between the points, but I'm not clear there. How to use runtime post-processing functions such as forces while running a case in parallel. That is quite complicated for a while. I don't think that was actually possible. Um, if nothing else, uh, it might be that you need to, I would, well, 
I think what should happen is that your different instances of the code should process the bit of the field that they can each see, but that's only a guess there. Does the averaging tool also work for point probed parameters or only work for field values? It works for field values. It's a field, it's averaging the field value here. Of course, you could easily then take the data and average it yourself. That's relatively straightforward. I'm guessing also that you could, uh, if you got the ordering of the function objects right, you could create your averaging field and then sample it prop plausibly. I would guess these are evaluated in the order you put them in the control dict. But I would confess I'm not, I, I would want to test that myself actually. Okay, I've got a couple more minutes to do some really quite complicated stuff here. I've called this all advanced because it, it is, and it covers a couple of things you guys have been throwing at, or one thing you guys have been throwing at me, which is the graphics, and the thing which I like to include, which is the program. Okay, so it's really, Coming back to Anna, she wanted to animate her results and she was trying to solve, she was trying to save hundreds of time step directories of her calculations and uh, saving all the necessary files and then post processing these using power parafoam afterwards and it was just it was using huge disk space problems. I pointed her to this feature of the function objects and it solved the problem. One of the function objects, a couple of the function objects here are graphical function objects. They interface with VTK, they sample the information graphically and export it as .vtk files containing graphical representations which can then be, um, which can then be um, visualized in ParaView and potentially turned into images which you can then an animate. So one of them is surfaces and this takes a, some sort of cutting plane through the domain, samples it and creates a visual interpretation of it. So various control bits here, um, right control time step. So it's going to evaluate things based on the time step. And now it's going to write it out every 10 time steps, which may not be how often I'm saving the data itself. Surface format VTK, it's going to export it as VTK files based on the velocity here, specifying an interpolation scale scheme here, and we're going to put in particular surfaces here. And in this particular case, I've run it using a surface definition, uh, Z normal here, cutting plane here. Plane type can specify the cutting plane in, in a number of different ways. I've gone for point and normal, so I'm going to specify a point on the plane and its normal direction and the Z direction. And every 10 time steps, it's going to, the code is going to evaluate this and generate a VTK file as a appropriate. Now, there are actually eight different surfaces, which I evaluated using the banana trick. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you're ever struggling to find out what the options are, do substitute for what you've got the word banana or anything else, but banana is the usual one. So type banana, it'll give you an error message, which will list all of the possible options. And for example, in this particular case, there are eight different surface types, including isosurface and patch being possibilities. And for a plane, there are several different ways of defining the plane. Point and normal, three points, which is something called embedded points, or the coefficients of the plane equation. Plane equation. So I can run that here. This takes a little while to run because obviously a more complicated calculation, but it started at 15 because that's where I started it from. And after 10, sec 10 time steps, hopefully,
you go to proposed processing, cut a cutting plane here, you'll see that it's thrown out a VTK file. So OF, OF8, like that. And there's my instantaneous data file. And that's because that's just two dimensional. So it's a lot less information than you would see otherwise. I'm conscious that actually I've got th three. I had three more things to show you here. I'm not sure I'm going to have time for it. But uh, another really valuable function object here is scalar transport. Now, I don't know if any of you were at Henrik Ruscher's talk yesterday about how to implement a scalar transport equation. And that's really good programming, but it's not necessarily something you always want to do. Alternatively, another way of doing this is to use the scalar transport function object. And this is something which is only ever run at runtime, so it's only really relevant for runtime function objects, not a post-processing activity, but it adds an arbitrary scalar equ transport equation to any of your flow codes. Now, in order to make this work, you need an initial condition. So you need to set up an appropriate field in the starting time step directory. And you can do this for any dimension set here. You also need appropriate entries in FE schemes to control it. But if you include that, then this is the sort of thing you've got here. You've got to scale a transport function object. And I've, those are all the things you actually need, but you can specify other parameters here. So, for example, I've called my field concentration. So I will need to provide a concentration field file in the zero time step directory. I've said that I'm going to use my existing phi, um, fun, my phi, um, um, if, um, if, um, quantity here to do the transport. I'm going to use differencing schemes, which are the same as I use for the U velocity field. And I'm going to use the turbulent viscosity as my diffusivity. You can also specify a constant or laminar diffusivity or switch that off completely. And if you do that, then you can then run the calculation with this in and you can add a scalar transport equation to, for example, your, your simple phone calculation. Finally, what do you do if there isn't a function object available? Can you write your own? You can. That's the whole point about open frame. You can write anything you like in it. In, if you're actually programming it yourself, what you would need to do is to derive it from one of the base classes. And I think the one to use would be field expression, but there might be other ones depending on exactly what you're implementing here. Compile it as a shared object library, and then it will be something you can add on, you can access in the usual way at runtime. But that's quite a lot of effort, particularly if you're not used to it. But there's another function object, which is a coded function object, which you can use to implement your own functionality in a slightly more um, simplistic manner. So I've shown, I've, this is my final couple of slides, honest. Um, I've shown you this, how to create one of these. And it addresses the question I was asked at the beginning, how do I deal or sort of addresses it, how do I deal with grid scale and subgrid scale kinetic energies? And I was trying to do this for a Taylor Green vortex calculation. I realized I wanted to evaluate um, half V squared for the grid scale velocities plus the turbulent kinetic energy. So I wrote myself a function object to do this. The basic function object looks like this, and the critical keyword here is code execute here, and everything between these hashes here, these hash lines here, is code which is going to be executed. And this is the bit of code I put in here. And if you're familiar with open phone programming, this sets up a new Volve scalar field called ET and instantiates it with the velocity squared plus the turbulent kinetic energy. 
And then it writes out, then it will save that at the right time. So it also writes out to the terminal line, the time and the averaged value, which is what I was after there. Having done that, when I run the case, it compiles this code, adds it as a new function object, and then runs it as a function object. Okay, um, I think I'm afraid that I have run over time here. Um, I want to additional questions. I will go through the questions as far as I am, if I am able to at the end of uh, uh, this afternoon at some point, and I'll see if I can answer any more. And as I say, I will um, package all of this up and provide it to you through Phil Cardiff's good good nature, um, uh, good organisation, I guess. So I'm guessing he will explain how to get to access things like this afterwards. So um, thank you for your attention. Um, sorry I ran out of time. I always do that. Um, um, I look forward to seeing you in person next time we have a, a, an open phone workshop, which I believe is going to be in Cambridge next year. I'm really hopeful it's in, in person. So I hope to see you there. Thank you very much for your attention.